And we start off with Surah Yasin, and I will say that Surah Yasin isn't just my favorite surah, it is everybody's favorite surah, alhamdulillah. And Surah Yasin, it goes back to the early uh, Meccan period. And the primary theme of Surah Yasin throughout the entire surah, beginning to end, it is to prove the hereafter and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indeed the one who will bring back our souls and uh, resurrect us. And there are a number of narrations found in our books of hadith that mention that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam praised Surah Yasin seen in some narrations he called it the qalb al-Qur'an, the heart of the Qur'an. Scholars differ about the authenticity of those narrations, but there's no problem in narrating them and saying these are found in the books of hadith. And it is authentically narrated for sure that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he instructed us, he encouraged us to recite Surah Yaseen over those who are on their last, uh, on, the, on the very last throes of life. They're about to pass on from this world. They're on their deathbeds. We should ease that uh, by reciting Surah Yasin. And of course, what a beautiful Surah because the concept of Surah Yasin is to talk about the hereafter and the next life. And so Surah Yasin is giving them comfort that this is just the beginning of inshaAllah Ta'ala, a brighter life after this. Uh, the story begins, or Surah Yasin begins, sorry, with the power of the Quran and the uh, the impact that the Quran has on the people. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala uh, mentions that they have put a bar that Allah has placed a barrier in front of those who reject the Quran. And He has placed a barrier behind them and He has enshrined them so that they cannot even see. And it is authentically narrated that our Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was surrounded on the night of the Hijrah to Medina, he exited his house and there were over 40, 50 people wanting to kill him. And all he did, he recited Surah Yasin and he recited, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ We blinded them فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ They will not be able to see. He recited the Surah Yasin and the first page of Surah Yasin and they were blinded. They had no idea that the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam is walking from right under their uh, midst. And in this Surah as well, verse number 12, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى We shall indeed bring back the dead. We shall revive the dead. وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُمْ And we will write down everything that they have forwarded. And we're even going to write down their footsteps and their legacies and everything we have tallied together in a clear book in an imam, in a book that is prescribed. And it is reported that the Prophet SallAllahu used this verse when a tribe by the name of Banu Salama wanted to sell everything and move to the center of Medina so that they could live next to the Prophet SallAllahu They said, Ya Rasulullah, we want to pray every prayer with you and we walk all the way from our houses an hour away and we pray and we walk back. We decided to sell everything and come close to you so that we can be with you short walks. And our Prophet SallAllahu Allahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Bani Salama, that oh, uh, 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 the people of the Salama, diyarukum tuktabu atharukum. Stay in your houses. Your footsteps are being recorded by Allah. And in one report, he recited this verse, or this verse was revealed uh, basically as a second time that وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُمْ We're going to write down every footstep. No matter how small it is that we do something for the sake of Allah, don't look at how insignificant it is. Whatever it is, one footstep you do for the sake of Allah, Allah will record it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for it. So Yasin then moves on to the story of the three people who were sent to a neighboring town. First there were two, they rejected them, then Allah added a third, فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثِ And most likely this is a reference to the early followers of Jesus Christ, of Isa, and they were preaching uh, to the people who did not believe in Allah. And so the righteous Christians, three of them, they went to the town of Antioch and they were rejected and they were mocked and they were about to be killed when a local person came rushing and وَجَاءَ رَجُمْ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ And a man came uh, from the furthest part uh, of the town. And he said, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى A man came from the furthest part of the town, rushing. And he said, قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ He said, O oh my people, follow the these uh, messengers. By messengers, he doesn't mean prophets of God. He means messengers that have been sent by another prophet, meaning Isa has sent them, whether alive or dead, whether in the life of Isa, excuse me, or whether Isa was lifted up. Isa did not die, that was a slip of the tongue. But Isa radiallahu anh, uh, Isa uh, alayhi salatu wasalam, he sent his followers either in his life 
time or he told them after he was raised up to go and preach. So Isa went, his followers went to the town of Antioch and they're preaching to the town of Antioch. And one of the locals embraces the message. And he says that you should follow these three people. And the locals were about to kill the three people, the three disciples of Jesus or the three followers of Christianity. And one of their own seems to have sided with the followers of Jesus. So they then turn their anger on one of their own and they surround this other person whom they knew very well, a nobleman from their own town. And they say to him, have you embraced this faith? And he says, Why shouldn't I embrace this faith? Why shouldn't I worship the one who created me? And you shall all be going back to him. Do you want me to worship false gods instead of him? Indeed, if the Rahman desires a harm for me, all of these gods will not help me, nor will they save me. If I were to do this, I would be completely lost and misguided. Guided. Inni amantu bi rabbikum. I have believed in your Lord, your Creator. So listen to me, obey me. Qila dhulil jannah. It was said, enter jannah. There is a missing scene here. It is understood by the context, and that missing incident is that they killed him, they murdered him. The people of Antioch, or this people of this town, they ganged up on one of their own and they massacred, they killed uh, this person, and uh, they beat him to death. And when they beat him to death, Allah subhanahu wa taala says, Qila dhulil jannah. They were killed him in this world, and because he's a shaheed, he is automatically in jannah. It was said to him, enter Jannah. And when he sees Jannah, what does he say? قَالَ يَا لَيْتَ قَوْمِ يَعْلَمُونَ بِمَا غَفَرَ لِي رَبِّي وَجْعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُكْرَمِينَ How I wish my people could see this. How I wish they could know that my Lord has forgiven me and my Lord has shown so much honor on me. Subhanallah, this was a man whom the people killed. They ganged upon, they beat him to death. According to one report, they literally kicked him and they punched him until he died. And as soon as he is killed, he wakes up in Jannah. Literally one second he is being killed, the next second he sees Jannah and what is on his mind? He says, oh, how I wish my very people who killed me, how I wish that I could show them this reality that I'm speaking the truth to them, I'm telling them the truth. And what this shows as some of the Sahaba remarked that this was a person who truly cared about his people while alive and then in death as well. That even when they killed him, his heart was still full of compassion that I want my people to know the truth. And what this shows us, if you want to influence others, if you want to guide others, if you want to be a preacher or caller to Islam and to walk in the footsteps of the prophets of Allah, then you must, you must have a genuine compassion, a genuine love for the people that you want to guide. You will not guide people if you have a sense of arrogance and hatred in your heart against them. And the story of this man clearly shows that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, he, he mentions that even the creation and the angels, they express their pity and their frustration at the stubbornness of men. Verse 30, Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. This is something that the angels and the creation is saying, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The angels and the creation are saying out, woe is it to these servants, these creation, this man. Alas for these servants, these creations that are known as men. No messenger comes to them, but they ridicule him. Don't they understand? What is their problem? Why are they so stubborn about accepting the truth and about submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the creation is expressing its pity and its frustration that out of all of the species on earth, it is only man who is so arrogant as to reject the truth. And they are wondering what is wrong with us? Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. And hasra is a sense of both frustration and pity. Like, come on, what's your, what's wrong with you? You know, accept the uh, invitation of the prophets and messengers. And then after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions three ayah. Wa ayatul lahum, wa ayatul lahum, wa ayatulahum. Three signs, three miracles that shows not only that he is the Rabb, but also that he is capable of bringing the dead back to life. The first of them, وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ الْأَرْضُ الْمَيْتَةُ A sign for them is in the dead land. We give it life and we produce from it grains and corn and crops so that they can eat. لِيَأْكُلُوا مِنْ ثَمَرِهِ وَمَا عَمِلَةُ أَيْدِيهِمْ 
and that they can eat of the fruits and they can also eat of what their hands have helped to produce, won't they be uh, appreciative? Afala yashkurun, Subhanalladhi khalaq al azwaja kullaha. Glory be to Allah who created everything in pairs. The fruits are in pairs and they themselves are in pairs and even things that they do not do know, they're also in pairs. So this is the first sign, the one who can bring the dead land back to life and the one who can create life from seeds and the one who can produce crops and grains, that one can also bring you back from the dead. The second, وَآتُوا لَهُمُ اللَّيْلُ نَسْلَخُ مِنْهُ النَّهَارِ Another miracle and sign for them is the night that we strip it away from the day. The day and the night, they go slowly but surely, gradually they merge into one another. وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرِّ لَهَا And the sun, it runs towards its destination. It has an appointed uh, point, uh, appointed uh, course that it is following. ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ Such is the power and design of the one who is all powerful the one who is all mighty. And the moon, we have disposed of it in various places. manazil, And the manazil is a phrase in Arabic that means every single night, the moon has a special manzil. There are around 28, they say manazil of the moon, then one night the moon is not seen. And so 28 manazil are of there of the moon. This is the astronomical calendar of the moon. And Allah is saying, I am the one who has put the moon in these manazil. manazil. Until when it comes back, it returns like the old twig, al-urujun al-qadim. And if you've ever seen an old twig from the tree of the dates, you will see that it looks like a crescent, very fragile, very yellowish, very thin. And so Allah is comparing that when the moon comes back, it looks like this old twig. That uh, Then Allah says, that neither can the sun overtake the moon. nahar. Nor will the night outpace the day. Kullun fi falakin yasbahun. Everyone is in its place in harmonious orbit. This is the second sign. The one who can control these massive celestial objects, that entity can also bring you back from the dead. And the third of his majestic signs that he asks us to think about is the fact that we have been given power over the creation. We can do amazing feats. We can ride the waves and the oceans, who could have ever imagined that us creatures were going to be able to conquer the oceans and in our times even more than this. There is no problem, it is a part of our tafsir genre and tafsir methodology to extrapolate from these verses the blessings of cars and airplanes that Allah is saying, I gave you this knowledge and I blessed you with this type of technology that you're able to benefit. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the one who has given you so much knowledge that you can then do all of this, surely that entity can also then bring the dead back to life. Now what is the response to all of these miracles? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verses 44 onwards, that Allah says, that no miracle comes to them, no sign comes to them, except that they are mu'ridin, they turn their backs away. And when they're reminded, when the people come and try to advise them, when it is said to them, "Anfiqu mimma razaqakum Allah," spend from what Allah has given you. Those who reject, they say to those who believe, "Why should we feed those whom, if Allah wanted, He could feed directly? You are all lost and misguided. You want us to take care of the poor people? Allah created them. Allah made them hungry. Let Allah feed them directly." And what a powerful uh, analogy is being given here. I should, not analogy, a powerful, uh, if you like, uh, symbolic difference between the attitudes of those who believe and those who reject. Look at the completely contradictory mentalities. The believer, the mu'min, the one who wants to worship Allah, he sees hungry people and immediately what comes to his mind, Allah has given me more than them. Let me help them. I want Allah to use me to do good. I want to be servicing the creation of Allah with the blessings that Allah has given me. I want to be an instrument in spreading Allah's mercy. So he looks at the scene and he says, you know what, I want to make a difference and I want to feed the hungry. And he says, come, let's all donate, let's come together, let's feed the hungry. Now, what do those who reject religiosity, who, re who reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? They become sarcastic, they become haughty and arrogant. And they say, why should I feed? I mean, your God is all powerful. Your God is the one that did all of this anyway. He can feed himself. And this is the difference between Iman and Kufr, between religiosity and atheism. A religious person, a person who believes in Allah, a person whose heart is full of compassion, he looks and he sees, what can I do to make a difference? Whereas the one who has no faith, you will find him to be bitter, angry, arrogant, always mocking. Oh, well, why doesn't your God do it? Why doesn't your God take care of it? 
it. And this person doesn't understand that perhaps that hungry person is there so that Allah can see what we do. And Allah will reward the hungry person. Allah, Allah will reward us. There's a hereafter that we have to also take into account. But look at the difference. And this is the exact same difference, by the way, between Adam and Iblis. Adam and Iblis. Adam said, I made a mistake. What can I do to make up for it? Iblis said, it's all your fault, O oh Allah. You're the one who did all of this. It's not my fault. This uh, difference in mentality, it goes back all the way to the beginning of the creation. Dear Muslim, when you see something negative, think about how you can make it into a positive. Think about what can I do to better the situation. Don't blame anyone else and whatnot. I mean, even if people are worthy of being blamed, that has its place if somebody else is at fault. But you also have a role. What can I do to make it better? And this verse really shows us the attitude of the mu'min is always proactive. It's always bringing benefit wherever the person goes. Whereas the person of no faith, all they do is they sit back and criticize. And worse than this, a'udhu billah, A'udhu Billah, the one who have no faith actually ends up blaming A'udhu Billah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa then reminds them in Surah Yasin of what will happen when the Day of Judgment uh, occurs. That uh, it's only just one, uh, one trumpet blow and lo and behold, they will be brought before us. They shall be resurrected. Qalu ya waylina, verse 52, man ba'athana min marqadina. Who has resurrected us from our resting place, our graves? We were here, what's going on here? Then the believers will say to them, هَذَا مَا وَعَدَ الرَّحْمَانُ وَصَدَقَ الْمُرْسَلُونَ This is the promise of Ar-Rahman and the, the prophets spoke the truth to us. And this shows us that on the day of judgment, people will be cognizant enough, aware enough to ask questions and to have conversations. And so people will be wondering what is going on? Where are we? Why are we being resurrected? What's going on? And the righteous will say that this is now the time that all of you denied. It is now happening over here. And then in uh, verses 55 onwards, Allah describes the people of Jannah and the people of Jahannam. Inna ashab al yawma fi shughulin fakihun. The inhabitants of Jannah, the people of Jannah on that day, they shall be busy in entertainment. What an interesting way. Shughul and fakihun. So shughul is to be uh, busy and fakihun is to be basically having a fun time. So Allah is saying that Jannah, there will be so much to do that you will be busy entertaining yourselves, that you lived a difficult life, you worshiped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now you will be spoiled for pleasures, anything that you want. Hum wa azwajuhum, them and their spouses, they shall be in shades, reclining on couches. They will have in it all types of fruits, all types to eat. And they will have whatever they desire, whatever you want. Dear Muslims, whatever you want, you will get it in Jannah. A Sahabi said, O Messenger of Allah, you know, I like to plant, I like to have a green thumb, I like to plant. And I like to have grow trees. So will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow me to uh, grow trees in Jannah? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave a beautiful description. Yes, indeed, you will grow the tree. It will grow this big and this and that. At which one of the muhajirun said, O Messenger of Allah, that person who asked you, he must be from our Ansari brethren because us muhajirun, we do not like to work in the backyard. We don't like to work in the fields at all. So the point is that whatever you have as your mind, some people say, why does Jannah describe only certain you know worldly pleasures and the response is this is but one example and it is an example by the way that all of mankind appreciates and likes the pleasures of the soul the pleasures of the body eating and drinking and the sensual pleasures of course this is a part and parcel of Jannah but it's not all of Jannah Jannah is more than this this verse is very clear whatever you want shall be yours if you want to interact or have discussions or talk or you know whatever you want to do you will be able to do that in that place forever and ever without ever getting bored. They will be busy entertaining themselves. And then the best of all pleasures, the highest of all pleasures, verse 58, Salamun qawlam min Rabbil Rahim. They shall hear Allah say salam to them. And then other verses describe the seeing of Allah. So hearing the speech of Allah and seeing the face of Allah, this is the highest reward of Jannah. Nothing is higher than and that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Jahannam before moving on to the final concluding passages of the surah by reminding man of a number of obvious blessings of them. Verse 71, 
Amen. Don't they see that we have gifted them from what we ourselves have, have uh, brought about, livestock that they own? That we have subdued it for them. So uh, some of them they ride and some of them they eat. And they have other benefits. And they drink from these animals. Will they not give thanks? And this verse or this series of verses, once again, it goes back to a point I made a number of lectures ago. This is one of the most explicit verses that not all species are the same. The one who created the species has the right to provide a hierarchy of those species. And in these series of verses, you cannot get more clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, we created these animals and species, these livestock, and we, and we subdued these species for them. Look, these animals are bigger than us. They are heavier than us. They are more powerful than us. And yet they are dhalil unto us. And dhalil here means that we have control over them they have submitted and subdued on, uh, themselves unto us. And Allah says, we're allowed to ride them, we're allowed to eat them, we're allowed to take their milk, their drink. This is very clear. And they have other benefits as well. In some places and lands, you need to use their leather to protect yourself from this and that. So Allah Azza wa Jal is explicitly allowing us, if again, we treat them ethically and we do everything in accordance with the name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, then yes, it is permissible to benefit. And so Allah says, afala yashkurun will they not give uh, thanks? This is one of the blessings at the end of the surah. Another, or another miracle, another miracle that Allah says, Awalam yara insanu, doesn't mankind see that we created him from a nutfa, from a, a, a seed, a mixture of fluids, and yet فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُبِينٌ Lo and behold, he comes from a despised fluid, and yet he has the arrogance, he has the audacity to challenge us. وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسِيَ خَلْقَ And he starts arguing with us, he produces his pseudo-evidences against us, even as he forgets his own creation, and he challenges who is going to bring the dead back after they have have decayed. This is a reference to uh, Abu Jahl or perhaps Umayyah uh, that uh, uh, a number of uh, books mention that when uh, once one of these leaders of the Quraysh uh, came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umayyah bin Khalaf or Abu Jahl or somebody else, he picked up a bone that was decaying and he crumbled it in his hands and he wagged this bone and he crumbled it in his hands and he said that do you think that uh, O Muhammad Sallallahu do you think that your Lord will bring my bones back after they have become Ramim like this? And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed Surah Yasin in which Allah describes not just his state of mind, but the state of mind of anyone who is so arrogant as to reject Allah, to deny a God. This verse is so powerful. There he is in his arrogance saying, where is the proof? Show me the signs. And he has forgotten, ignored his own creation. Are you that blind that you're demanding proof when you yourself are the greatest proof of the existence of Allah? He who cannot even see his own existence as a proof of the existence of the Creator, what other proof is ever going to satisfy him or her? Look at how powerful this verse is. What other proof do you need that there's a powerful Creator out there? Look at your own body. Look at where you came from. Look at how you live. Look at each and every aspect of the creation. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal is saying throughout the Quran, they're asking you for miracles. The miracles around them are enough. These other miracles are not going to make them uh, believe. And this is a reality that anybody who negates uh, the existence of a God. The fact of the matter is that they keep on demanding for proof. The fact of the matter is there is no proof that would satisfy them. Nothing would satisfy them. And what they claim is mere words. If the creation around you is not enough to prove to you the existence of a creator, what other evidences is there? So these are the Quranic uh, arguments, so simple, so straightforward, so incontrovertible. They're watertight. That's the beauty of the Quranic arguments. They're watertight, they appeal to every single person. And this is one of the strongest arguments that uh, Allah Azza wa Jal uses, not just for his existence, but in fact, for the, uh, for the bringing back of the dead and the, uh, the day of judgment. And 
Allah Azza wa Jal also says in verse 80 that He is the one who has produced for you fuel min al-shajar al-akhdar from the green trees which you kindle your fire with. So the wood that you use, all types of fuel that you use, He is the one who gifted it for you. Can't the one who created this recreate it all over again? Of course He can. إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْءً يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ فَسُبْحَانَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ مَلَكُوتُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ his command when he will something is to merely say be and it is. So all glory be to him in whose hands is the control and dominion of all things and to him we shall all return. This is Surah Yasin.